Hi everyone and welcome to our screencast on classical Greece. All right, let's get right to it. The main idea is that classical Greek ideas about government, philosophy, and the arts created the foundation of Western society. A classical re uh, Greece refers to the time period from 500 BC, which marked the defeat of the Persian Empire, to 338 BC, which marks the actual takeover of the Greek Empire, which we'll get to in our next screencast. Okay, part of this era was also known as the Age of Pericles. Uh, he became a dominant leader in Athens after the defeat of the Persians. Okay, this age witnessed an expansion of the empire that is considered the height of Athenian power and brilliance. It's also known for the expansion of democracy to all male citizens um, and enabled it to play a, somewhat of a role in government. And we look back at this period as a, an experiment in direct democracy, okay, as we see in the, the little visual to the bottom, power to the people, which you know is popular sovereignty, uh, a term you may have picked up in civics last year. Okay, so let's briefly take a look at, at the two different types, the modern U.S. democracy and Athenian democracy. We can see that the population was roughly the same, but the number of eligible voters is much different. Can you tell the difference here, okay, from Athenian to, to modern? Also, the participation was different. One was direct and one was representative. And then the eligibility was much different as well. Okay, so what conclusions can you draw between Athenian democracy and the modern U.S.? What similarities were there and what differences are there? Okay, this is something that we'll discuss a little bit more so as the unit progresses. Okay, Sparta. They feared that the Athenian Empire was growing too large and too powerful, and that led to the outbreak of the Great Peloponnesian War in 431 B.C. Okay, if we actually take a look at this map here, um, we can see how the Spartan allies, okay, in the, uh, in the purple and the you know, the orange colors, the Athenian League. It was really a coalition of many different city-states. It wasn't just Athens versus Sparta, but it really dragged in most of the other city-states in the region. Okay, Athens in the end lost the war, um, and the Athenian Empire was completely destroyed. The war weakened all the major Greek states as well. It, it didn't lead to this big Spartan takeover of the whole empire. It really started the eventual collapse uh, of ancient Greece. They also took their eye off the north. Okay? There was a growing empire in Macedonia at the time, and they eventually would come down and conquer the Greek city-states. Okay, uh, let's mo moving on to the intellectual and cultural aspects of classical Greece. It was known as a period of growth. Okay, and uh, part of this was due to their expansion in, in military power, but um, this period was marked by a lot of intellectual and cultural uh, developments. Okay, the most important form of architecture at the time was the temple. Okay, and that was dedicated to a god or a, guard, a goddess. Okay, the Parthenon is the greatest example of a classical Greek temple. Okay, it was dedicated to the goddess Athena. Um, it also expressed pride uh, in the city-state itself. Okay, the architecture too, it represented a classical style of architecture and, and some of the characteristics of it were uh, the calmness, clarity, and freedom from unnecessary detail. And we can see that in the open nature of it in the columns. Um, and that if, if you're interested in, in art history or architecture, this would be something that you can definitely pursue uh, in our unit work. Okay, now moving to dramas. Uh, the idea of dramas as we know were invented by the Greeks, and they, they were the first to create dramas and tragedies, usually in trilogies, although I, I believe only one of them is still surviving to this day. They also later developed comedies, and comedies were developed as social critiques, okay, critiques of some aspect of society. They were intended to entertain people, but also provoke reactions, and it's really not dissimilar to many comedies today. A lot of comedies today have, have social commentary li linked in with it. Okay, if you think of political satire, uh, political cartoons, they're funny, but they also have a message behind them. Okay, now moving to philosophy. Okay, a lot of people get confused with philosophy. But think of it this way. In its most basic sense, a philosophy is an organized system of thought. And three Greek philosophers really stepped out or, or, or um, were the most widely known in, in that time period. We have Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, and, and we consider them the foundations of Western philosophy. Okay, we'll start with Socrates. He believed that the goal of education was to improve the individual. Okay. He also had uh, a saying that the unexamined life is not worth living. Okay, so we need to uh, question things. Okay, and one of the things that he had people ponder was the idea of ethics. Okay, he taught students to live their lives by a, a particular code of ethics that his students would grapple with. 
Okay, he also used a question and answer format to lead students to find the answer for themselves. He believed that everybody had the knowledge and wisdom within them. He, it's just he had to help get them through his questioning techniques to the answer. And that Socratic method is actually still used today widely in, in education. A lot of teachers still use this and should use it because it is a proven method of, of learning. Okay, Plato, he was a student of Socrates and he was fascinated with the question of reality. Okay, he also wrote about government in his work titled The Republic. He had an interesting viewpoint on this. He was actually very skeptical um, of democracies. He was very distrustful of them. And he thought we should set up three groups in society, one group of philosopher kings, one group of warriors to establish order, and then the masses. And if everyone functioned how they were supposed to and, and followed their particular roles and didn't abuse their powers, there would be a smooth functioning society in the end. Okay, and he was considered by many to be the greatest philosopher of Western civilization. Uh, he also set up what's called the School of Athens. And actually, I brought up this picture. This was a painting by Raphael, and, and it shows uh, many of the philosophers of the time and even the Renaissance all kind of mixed together into this School of Athens. I actually, if I, if I believe correctly, he actually painted himself in there as well somewhere in that picture. Okay, Aristotle, he was the student of Plato. He believed that people's happiness is tied to their behavior. He was also interested in classifying and analyzing things based on observation and investigation. Okay, uh, So not just passively learning things, but going out, observing, investigating, and coming up with particular theories and I ideas and concepts. Okay, He didn't seek an ideal state. He realized that that was impossible. But he studied existing governments, saw how they worked, and he favored what's called a constitutional government. Okay. These writings from all of these philosophers actually heavily influenced our own founding fathers of the United States. When they were drafting their constitution, that was the first large-scale democracy since the ancient Greeks. Okay, So they looked back at a lot of their experiences when they were shaping uh, our own constitution, which has changed much since then, but they laid the groundwork. Okay, I hope you enjoyed our, our uh, brief screencast on classical Greece. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll see you next time.